Um, okay, so uh, virtual pets. Before I dive into the virtual, let's take a look back at the real. Because real pets are huge, and maybe you didn't even know how, how big they are. They, they are. So worldwide, no one knows how many cats and dogs there are exactly in this world, but the conservative estimate is that there are well upwards of uh, 400 million. Um, now, um, in the US alone, one in three children grows up with or near a pet. Um, Americans have spent upwards of $60 billion on pets in 2015. Um, most of that for pet food, by the way. Um, another good third for medical care, vets, and just uh, uh, two billion of those 60 billions for actual pets. Um, so taking care of them is much more expensive than the pets themselves. Uh, that number, by the way, um, represents a five, uh, four to five percent annual growth since 2010 which uh, is about the same as the games industry, just that pets are much bigger. Um, now, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people ask themselves, why are we so intrigued by pets? Isn't that kind of frivolous that we have all these useless animals living in our homes? But um, as a social psychologist, I would argue that pets really tap into something basic in our human nature. And I want to mention three things. First of all, play, obviously, right? We have a human instinct for play, which to some extent is satisfied when we interact uh, with pets. Second, nurturing. Um, we all like to nurture, unless we are psychopaths. This holds really for, for everyone, men, women, old, young. Um, taking care of others can be a basic source of fun. Um, this is something we do with pets. And finally, and this is not very often mentioned, but something which I'm very sensitive to, it's that we have basic need for social responsiveness. Um, Oleg mentioned that before in his talk, right? You, you see a screen with little shapes and animals, you touch them and something happens. And that gives us pleasure. And it doesn't matter if you're a kid or if you're a grown-up. And pets, because they're alive, they give us this basic pleasure, right? Um, think of uh, playing with a dog and fake throwing a ball, right? It's fun. You see the dog understanding that something weird is happening, right? And like you, you fake throw the ball a few times and the dog starts to get what's happening and doesn't run after the ball anymore and is really excited. Um, so there's something really basic going on with pets and human nature. But we forget that having an actual pet is also a luxury. And according to at least uh, uh, one observer, um, last year a researcher on, uh, uh, on virtual pets, quote, pet ownership in its current form is likely unsustainable in a growing urbanized population. Um, not everybody has a house in the garden. Not everybody has money for dog food. A lot of people live in high rises uh, in suburbs of huge Chinese cities, or they uh, they are subject to house rules which forbid them to keep pets, or they have allergies. Um, so, if this number one in three Americans, which you saw before, tells us something, uh, you compare that to the 400 million pets outside in the world. There's a huge underserved um, de desire. Like a, a lot more people who could have pets or who would like to have pets are in practice not really able to have pets. Um, which for me constitutes a really interesting reference point for virtual pet games. I like to keep that in mind when I think of virtual pet games. They have something to do not just with virtual but also with, with pets. So. Let's just take a look back at how virtual pet games have catered to these needs which I mentioned before. Um, for the sake of simplification, let's just assume that uh, virtual pet games start with the Tamagotchi in 1996. You all remember this little egg? 
in your hand um, an abstract little being which you had to nurture by pressing buttons, which you had to feed. And the, the basic mechanic which the Tamagotchi introduced, which made it so successful, was that this little abstract animal could die. So you had this looming threat of a virtual pet dying unless you obsessively took care of it. It was the bane of parents in the 90s, um, but it also created a lot, a lot of heartbreak in, in players themselves, which means that it touched upon something deep, right? It was more than a game. Next innovation, and I just want to focus on a few uh, innovation rooms over the years. Neopets in 1999, even more abstract consideration of pets, like there was not like actual movement animations, pets moving around going on, but it did take the idea of having a pet to a social level, right? It was a, actually still is, a browser-based game. Um, pets were something you could, uh, could share, some, something you could uh, talk about in, in communities. So virtual pet games became kind of a, an MMO. Next big step, 2005, Nintendogs. And uh, everybody remembers Nintendogs, but don't forget this was the most successful game on the original DS. It was one in five games up to that point, scoring a perfect uh, 40 in Japanese gaming magazine Famitsu. Um, and it was very, it was very well done. F good, good animations, um, good models. And nowadays, um, I would say that the state of the art is well represented by games such as Dark Hotel uh, on Android and the iPhone, which shows you right away. These are like screenshots which I haven't chosen to be mean. These are screenshots which I, having played this game, find representative. Um, the the animation quality. Um, has definitely not improved since Nintendogs on um, mobile virtual pet games. Now, um, are these games actual pets or are they just toys? Again, according to our researcher, uh, let me quote, another study showed that children associated a stuffed dog with friendship but a virtual dog with entertainment. The essence of that quote is that Virtual pet games, including the ones which are well done, like Nintendogs, are not even considered as realistic, as deep, as a stuffed toy. Which is actually, if you think about it, it shouldn't be a very high bar. They're just, they're by and large uh, toys. They're, they're little playthings, which players often do not take like, uh, serious on a deeper level. This is where our company and our first game, A Dog's Heart, comes in. Let me show you a little footage. Um, we would like to do a live demo, but it turned out to be more feasible to just show you a gameplay video. Welcome to the first ever gameplay video of A Dog's Heart. A game for touchscreen devices, where you play as the caretaker of a magical island. You move around by swiping, Pinching and twisting. It's really easy. And you share this island with a little puppy called Mimi. So let's see how Mimi is doing. There she's sleeping. Okay, and there she woke up. How are you? Let's get a bit closer. Yeah, I think she wants to play, but we're not going to be able to run after her. And I hope she's just going to come back to us. Yes, there she's coming. Hey girl, you look happy. Okay, let's take a look at Mimi in augmented reality. There's a little puppy sleeping on the floor. Okay, woke her up. But she's sleepy, so we're gonna let her sleep. 
Okay, so that's where we are at the moment. Let me just uh, recap the, I think, three basic things we try to do differently uh, than previous Virtue Pet games, the core, really, of this project. Firstly, as you could see, uh, the animal now is able to move freely in an open world. In other Virtue Pet games, and keep in mind Nintendogs, you were always in these constrained situations, right? You were at a fixed camera angle, pet before you in a small space, like the living room or the street. Um, that is something which Virtue Pet games tend to do. Also think of Kinectimals, very similar, because an open world with AI is really hard to do. That's what we found out. Um, the, the AI, the navigation for this uh, technology took a long time to develop, but you can see it pays off because it gives the pet freedom. And dogs, but also cats and a lot of other um, domestic animals, they are, they are terrestrial animals, right? They want to move. They're usually faster than you. And for them, moving around is, is part of their essence, right? It's just what they do. Throwing a ball also wouldn't be possible without the pet being free. It definitely wouldn't be fun. Second thing um, is uh, behavioral believability. Of course, no one would mistake Mimi for an actual Dalmatian, and that's a good thing, as I'll uh, come back to later. Um, but we try to achieve something which we call behavioral believability. The, the idea that how the dog behaves is credible. It makes sense to you. You, you, you buy into the fact that she is a being. Um, which also means that the animal starts to be interesting enough in its behavior that you have to focus less on gamifying it to make it interesting. Like you had to gamify the Tamagotchi. The Tamagotchi itself is not interesting to watch, right? Um, even Nintendogs, like you look at them a few times and you realize it's always the same canned animation being played over and over again. So you need gamification, washing, feeding, buying stuff in order to keep players engaged. You need less of that with um, um, a, a, a more believably animated dog. Third, Mimi has a story. Of course, I'm not revealing anything right now, but there is an emotional arc. There is uh, a progression. You meet her in a situation where she is distressed, where she is scared. You gain her trust, you build up a relationship with her. So your rapport changes. Um, she's not available right away as virtual pets usually tend to be, which is also the reason why we can so quickly lose interest in them, because we already know they'll do everything to please us. Okay, one of the main inspirations for these choices has actually been, and of course I'm being very modest here, Walt Disney, um, because Disney, in my view, and that a lot of others, was the first in uh, animated movies to create depth, to create deep feelings, to create um, the this, this sense that what happened to uh, animated characters on screen really mattered at a deeper level. Think of Bambi. I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's uh, a, a cute fawn with a funny voice when you look at YouTube videos nowadays. But don't forget, in that movie, Bambi's mother dies. That's, that's pretty tough. If you think about it, that touches kids who watch that. Think of Dumbo, right? Dumbo is, at its core, a story about social exclusion. A little disabled, disfigured, child being excluded by, by elephant society and then finding his role because he discovers he has an ability that no one else has, he can fly. I would say that Disney broke my heart once when I was a kid, when I watched, and this is a very strong memory for me, The Fox and the Hound, right? The story of a fox uh, and a dog pup who are friends who just play along and then they grow up and they grow into these roles of the hunter and the hunted. That's a story that can get to you. It definitely got to me when I was a kid. Um, so why is it these, these, um, these uh, characters, the, these movies, 
these uh, um, cre creations are able to break our hearts. Um, first of all, they always start by creating an attachment, right? Um, when you when you meet Bambi, when you meet um, the fox and the hound, you meet them in situations which makes you like them, right? Which makes you root for them, which makes you be on their side. So when the next thing happens, which is usually suffering, you respond with empathy. And that's the core, right? That's a main mechanism for creating this kind of depth, this kind of um, tight, tight uh, engagement uh, in players. Let's, okay, I'm gonna finish on that question here. Is that something worth doing? Like, is, is, is the main problem of uh, virtual pet games so far that uh, we haven't broken our players' hearts yet? Um, well, it's not up to me to say this because I just want to emphasize I never made that choice. One of the things that motivates um, me in, in, in this project, um, in which you will find that uh, Mimi also has a distressing backstory, is my personal experiences with dogs, right? Because one of the, the problems with real pets is that they, they die eventually. And usually when they die, somebody's heart is broken. And that leaves traces, right? And that's something which I, in creating this game, was not able to forget, and which is just something that, uh, that um, came back to me. So, of course, like I promise, there will be no dead puppies uh, in my games. Nothing good ever comes of a pet dying. But there will be um, situations which demand the player to show empathy. Okay, I'll finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have you considered uh, making a version with cats? Of course I've considered it. Cats have one nasty habit. They climb. You might think that's a trivial difference, but if you're an animator, if you're building a complex artificial intelligence system, which has to take uh, into account things like obstacle avoidance, not running into trees, then changing from a 2D world of dogs to a 3D world of cats is a huge difference. So uh, it will be a good while before we can do cats. The advantage also in choosing dogs is that dogs, more so than cats, are very social animals. They, they have a real need themselves for the social responsiveness, which I mentioned earlier. Right? They come to you and they just uh, wag their tail and they want a reaction. Um, five times a day. And when they get that reaction, they are already quite happy, right? Um, so uh, that's, that's something which is really fun to create with AI and which is possible at the current state of the art. Having a cat, like, at, at the level of um, animation quality and, and visual quality which you saw in a dog's heart um, is possible, but it's, it would be very, very hard. Hello. Oh. Uh, why do you think that uh, not more gaming companies are trying to play on these emotional kind of uh, bonds that can be created between human animals? You know, I've seen some tries. I know Fable with the dog running around kind of works well. Other games trying to put in pets there. But why aren't they focusing even more on that? Isn't it really good to have a strong engagement with the user? Isn't it good for the team to be super motivated by reaching and touching the end user? Uh, I mean, why not? So what do you see? What's the obstacles? Um, I can only guess here. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a very good question. My guess would be that um, they simply don't know, right? Because you would have to have a skill set which few people in game development happen to have. It's kind of random that I am a social psychologist, right? If you think about it. But it really, really is not random. It's, it's essential for me doing this project because I have strong opinions on social behavior and on social interaction. Um, there are no good precedents for virtual pets that create the kind of depth that I've been talking about. So you would really have to invent the, the, the language um, of the, the, the behavior of this new kind of pet yourself. 
which is kind of what we're trying to do at Virtual Beings. Another problem is that um, like this only makes sense when you're ambitious about AI, and AI is a notoriously undersolved problem in games development. I would say it's one of the last remaining frontiers in games development, um, because we, we just don't know yet how to create um, uh, fully procedural animations, for instance, right? Such a thing. We don't know yet how to create um, safe navigation in a dynamic world. Th th these are research topics. They are not solved yet. I think these two are the, the answers I would give. Hi. Um, you talked uh, a little earlier about how uh, players viewed virtual pets as entertainment rather than with friendship. Um, to what degree do you think this is to do with some kind of functional fixedness through op um, interacting through a game console or similar, and what can be done to sort of break that functional fixedness? Of interacting through a game console? So because, or you're inter of because you're because interacting the through, um, uh, through a controller. A, ga a game, it, or sort of, if, if I play a PC, my assumption is I'm going to, if I bought a, a, a virtual environment, but I, I tend to think of it in terms of, oh, I bought this to have fun. Um, whereas what you're aiming at, or if I'm interacting through a DS or, uh, or a, a PSP or some kind of game platform, hmm. my uh, assumption... I mean, you're automatically constrained. You're limited in what you can do, and so you don't expect anything great to happen. Yeah, anyway. or the, my, my first assumption is that, oh, this is an entertainment product. Right. Um, well, you're never given the chance to find out anything else, right? There's no alternative product uh, trying to convince you that it's a real pet. So how would you know? The, the, the existing virtual pet games, and of course I'm overgeneralizing, but it's fun, <laughs> um, don't, don't uh, expect you to believe that <coughs> they are real, that they're trying to create something living, right? Um, the, go back to the example of Nintendogs, which I gave earlier. Nintendogs teaches you within a few seconds that the pet isn't real by looping animations, right? There's always the same kind of behavior going on, for instance, when you have your puppy at home. It always runs in circles, which, by the way, is something dogs basically never do at home just running in circles and then looking at you and pretending they're having fun, right? They interact with you and they interact with the environment. Um, so, so you see that and that tells your brain right away, okay, this isn't real anyway. This is just something to keep me busy. And it's keeping me busy in a nice way, but it's not living. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, looking at Tamaguchi, uh, there were two main things that sort of sold it, despite all its flaws and its primitive nature. Uh, and I think it was the reliance of the pet on you as a player. If you didn't take care of it, it died. Neediness. Yeah, they invented this idea that something virtual needs you, which yeah. was a great thing. Yeah. And uh, also that uh, it could actually develop and turn into different things, depending on how you took care of it. Is there any of those elements in your game, uh, A Dog's Heart? Uh, not in this game, but it's actually it's a relatively small game, and it's only the first game of many more to come. Um, having a, 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 a animated character at the complexity of which you saw, um, with 90 deforma def deforming bones, for instance, having this uh, grow from a puppy at about five months that you saw into an adult dog is hard, right? Um, so we're just not aiming on that because it's, it's a matter of complexity. Instead, what will be our next step is to uh, individualize dogs, to have a system where we can uh, basically create new dogs so that we give each player the possibility of having their own dog. There will then be progression again in the relationship between the player and their own dog, but it will be only a, a second or third step before you see this change in uh, the physique of the dog, like the dog growing bigger or the dog 
getting older, for instance. These are just very hard things to do. Yeah, sounds cool. Thank you.